Okay, so now let's consider chemical kinetics. So, so there are two different uh, okay, set of slides. Okay, so so I call a lecture. So that was lecture one in terms of you know slides. So I like eight sets. Okay. So we finish set one. So this is set two. So for chemical or the Mac reactions, there are two sets. So first set deals with you know just how do you write, okay, equation for the reaction rates. Okay. The second set will deal with the mechanisms. You know, so we'll just consider some commonly used mechanism for simple hydrocarbon fuels. Okay, in the third set. So I'll just give you the first the introductory part. Okay, what is chemical kinetics? So study of chemical kinetics. There are two main things. Okay, you know you study the elementary reactions. So elementary reactions means you know these reactions actually happen at the molecular level. Okay, so this so it's the study of elementary reactions and of course determine their rates of these elementary reactions. <coughs> And then you know development of a reaction mechanism. Okay. So you know if you take, for example, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay. So it goes through several steps before you get H2O. Okay. You know, in 70s and 80s, we used to use you know one reaction to produce H2O. So take H2 plus one half O2 or whatever amount of O2 gives you H2O. And write a global reaction. But that's not an elementary reaction. That's like a approximation for all those elementary reactions. So, so in the set three, we'll look at the mechanisms. Okay. So last, okay, whatever number of years, 50 years, there has been okay, a lot of development in this chemical kinetics area. Okay, a lot of fundamental analysis reported you know, based on you know, uh, finer the reaction rate theories, semi empirical approaches, and then more fundamental approaches like quantum chemistry. A lot of experiments have been performed. For experiments, they use shock tube, then they also use, you know, they call rapid compression machine. Okay. Mostly they use shock tube okay, setups to perform experiments to determine the reaction rates or even determine the mechanisms. And now you can find a lot of data, you know, shock tube data. Okay. And because of all this progress now, okay, a lot of mechanisms are available for, you know, especially for simple fuels. Okay. Hydrogen, CO, a lot of different hydrocarbons, and more and more mechanisms are being, you know, put online. You can download easily. Okay. <coughs> And these days, you know, like in 90s, in terms of mechanism, if you use a two-step mechanism for hydrocarbon, <coughs> you can publish, okay, or you can get some, you know, results. But these days, you know, people will laugh if you use a two-step mechanism, even for real combustors. Okay, so they are using very more detailed mechanisms. Still, a lot of cases, we you know, you are using not the full mechanisms, you know, what we call skeletal or reduced mechanisms. Okay, in terms of uh, ana analyzing combustion or flames, okay, we have to be aware of that. You know, in a reacting flow, there are several time scales. You know, reaction time, convection time, okay, or flow time. Sometimes we call it residence time. Okay, and then uh, other part of transport is the diffusion time. Little bit later, I think in set four and five, we'll, you know, talk about the diffusion process in detail. Okay. So this Demkohler number is the most important parameter, okay, analyzing, you know, flames. Or I should say, one of the most important parameters. Okay, Demkohler number, you can say, is like, you know, the Reynolds number in flows, or you have like. The Lewis number, not the Lewis number, the Prandtl number when you consider convective heat transfer. So similarly, Demkohler number. Like other dimensional numbers, this is a ratio of 
you can define in terms of the ratio of two characteristic <coughs> times. Okay. So here the two times will be a transport time. Okay. The transport time could be a convection time or a diffusion time, depending on the process. Okay. And the reaction time. Sir, one doubt, sir. Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, elementary reaction, sir. Yeah. Uh, whether for simple uh, fuels like carbon or hydrogen, like that, already they have, uh, have they established any fixed number of elementary reactions? Uh, identified only for this, only this number of reactions are possible. Like that, anything is. Uh, yeah, this is difficult. It's almost you can say, not like, At least possible. not in etched in stone. That okay. So I'll I'll show a mechanism which is more than you know anybody can use that mechanism, and still it has you know, this even detailed mechanism. Okay, it's not giving you, you know, right answer for all conditions. All these mechanisms they give you know, reasonable answers for certain conditions. Yeah, there, there's a lot of debate, you know, when you say, you know, people use DNS, direct numerical simulation, all right? So what is DNS? It means no models, but there's no such thing as no models, you know, because for combustion, you have to use first uh, some reaction model, right? So whether it's like eight steps or 800 steps, both are DNS, <laughs> right? So it only gives, you know, acceptable results under certain conditions. Okay. So when we go to flames, you know, I'll show some results, you know, using. Okay. Even here in the next set, there I'll show some results, you know. Like at high pressures, you know, for flame speed, they don't give good results. Okay. Some do, but some don't. Or for some fuel, you can get good results. For other fuels, you don't. Okay. So anyway, the damp color number. You can define in terms of the ratio of uh, the, uh, reaction time to, uh, sorry, the diffusion time to a reaction. So transport time or a flow time to a reaction time. Okay. I'm more used to you not know, defining in terms of rate. Okay, reaction rate, okay, divided by <coughs> the convection rate or flow rate. Okay. So, if the reaction is very fast, so obviously the reaction rate is very high. The Demko number is very large. Okay. So when the Demko number is large, you have a well-defined whatever flame. Okay. And then many times you can neglect the effect of chemistry because reactions are going on very fast. So then the, like the diffusion flame, process is determined by the transport you know, phenomena rather than the reactions because the reactions are almost instantaneous then. So the limit will be the infinite damp Kohler number. Okay. The reactions are infinite. Okay. Other extreme is, you know, when the damp Kohler number, the first one, the chemically frozen limit, okay, then the reactions are extremely slow. Okay. So this is like, you know, when you have like in a, a supersonic flow, you have this flow through a nozzle, there may be some reaction going on. But the flow is so fast, okay. So it's like chemically frozen. Reactions are not happening. <coughs> so that's the other limit. But most combustion situations, you have both, you know, comparable the transport time. So the damp color number is like more in the range of one, okay. So then you do, cannot neglect, you know, the chemistry effect. So now, <coughs> so now we'll consider, you know, how do you write the reaction rate for elementary reactions? Okay. So this is the general equation which is used. It looks very complicated, but when you actually use it, it's quite simple. So the nomenclature here is, you know, this is the reactant side, the product side, okay? So with a single prime, you know, if you see nu, okay, I is the species, okay. The nu is the stoichiometric coefficient, okay. For example, if you take this reaction, then you can easily explain this equation. So Ns here is the 
total number of species. Okay. So here, for example, NS will be four. Okay. So then you have first species, let's say, is O2. Okay. So M represents the species, so this will be O2. Okay. And the stoichiometric coefficient will be one. So new I prime will be one. Okay. So single prime is you know, the reactant side, double prime is the product side. Okay, same species. You know, I species, I species. Okay. So in this example, new one prime will be one. Okay new one double prime will be zero because O2 does not appear on the right hand side. Okay. So that's the convention we follow. So <clears throat> because if you have like 100 reactions, you can just write this equation for all those 100 because it will apply to all those because it's just a nomenclature. Okay. So using this as the basic equation, then we can write the reaction rate for this particular reaction. Okay. <clears throat> so we consider the rate of the change of moles of any species. Okay. So you can go over this slide, you know, from the notes. So I'll get to this result. We write this reaction rate for any species, for example, say species one. So the rate of change of the concentration of species one, okay, can be written. Okay, so this is for one reaction. So for any given reaction, we define a reaction rate. So the reaction rate is omega W, okay, pertains to that reaction, not to the species, just the reaction. Okay. And this is the okay, phenomenological law of mass rate. Okay. So you cannot have a, like a formal proof for this rate. Okay. So it's all proven empirically. Like if you apply to different reactions, you know, then you find that, yeah, this is valid. Just like Newton's law, you cannot prove. You prove only by demonstration. Okay. So same way, this phenomenological law of mass, mass rate this equation. So this is a very fundamental equation for elementary reactions. So, so k is the reaction rate constant. Okay. Actually, it's a very strong function of temperature. Okay. Call it the Ar Arrhenius equation. So this is the Arrhenius equation. Okay. <coughs> so it has a exponential dependence on temperature. There's also a weak dependence through this t to the power alpha. Alpha is like, you know, about 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.1 to 1. It could be minus or <coughs> positive. But the value is about 0 0.5 or 1. A is the pre-exponential factor. So if you plot the log of K versus 1 over temperature, okay, then, you know, this this value gives you the pre-exponential factor, the constant value, and the slope gives you then this E divided by RU. So E is the activation energy. Okay. So to determine the reaction rate for any reaction means you have to determine A, alpha, and E. Okay. So when you look at any mechanism, for, so there may have like 20 reactions or 100 reactions. For each reaction, they will specify these three constants, A, alpha, and E. Okay. Also, if activation energy means this is the energy barrier the molecules have to cross for reaction. Okay. So the idea is that, okay, what is reaction? Let's take the previous example, going back to the, okay. So this is one of the very common reactions for, okay, all hydrocarbon fuels. Okay. So what this means is, O2 molecules they are randomly moving, and H, okay, molecules atoms are randomly moving, okay, and during those random motion they collide, okay. So some of these collisions, 
react into, you know, result into reaction producing OHO. So those collisions have to be energetic enough. Okay. For example, you increase the temperature, the collisions become more energetic you know, because the molecules are moving faster. Okay. So this activation energy is the barrier they have to cross. If the energy of the collision is less than the barrier, then they will just collide, no reaction. Okay. So activation energy, if the activation energy is very high, then you have to have very high, temp high temperature for the reactions to occur. Okay. So that's the physical meaning. Okay. So high activation energy means less likely the reaction is going on at a given temperature. Okay. So there are two reactions. One has less smaller activation energy. That reaction is more likely to occur. Okay, because there are sometimes multiple reactions you have to consider, but then which one is more dominant also depends on the activation energy. Okay. So these are the very important parameters. Okay. So coming back, so K has three constants. <coughs> then you can write the general expression for the reaction rate for any given reaction. So K. And this is the product of the concentrations of species I on the reactant side only, because the Ci raised to the power is nu I prime. Prime is the reactant side. Okay. So for example, if you can consider say species one and two, so it'll be just C1 raised to the power nu one prime times C2 nu. So this is a product sign. So that's how you'll write any given reaction. Okay. So once you know this, then you can write the rate of change of concentration of individual species. So DC1, DT is, okay. So if you we'll consider again this reaction, okay. So what will be for O2? Okay. So it will be DC O2, DT will be, okay. This will be zero for O2. Okay, double prime. This will be minus one. So it will be minus omega O2. Okay. And for OH it will be plus omega. Okay. So you can write, you know, using this expression. Using this law and then using this equation. Once you determine omega then you can write for all the species in that reaction. Okay. So this is the same example. Okay. Here I'm considering H plus O2 giving OH. Okay. There will be other species. I didn't write all the species. So DH, DT will be minus omega and so on. Okay, now this is for one reaction. In a mechanism, you have many reactions. Okay. So here I is the species. So, so what I do now is I add this J for the number of reactions. So for one reaction, you have nu I prime, M I, sum, giving you nu I double prime, M I, correct, sum. <coughs> so now if you want to introduce the number of reactions, so we use J. So it's for the Jth reaction, you put J here, okay, and J here. Okay, that's all. So now J will be one, two, up to whatever is the number of reactions. And now, of course, okay, DCI DT, you have to consider all the reactions, okay. So earlier it was minus, not, let's not write minus, what was DCI DT? It was nu I double prime minus nu I prime omega, not omega I. And now, you have to sum it over all the reactions, so you have to put here omega j. 
and this will be new ij new ij so this is how you write this is how you write you know when you have number of reactions so here you are summing over all the reactions okay and for each reaction you have to write the reaction rate now okay so here also you will have ci you know, you will have new ij and then KJ for each reaction. Okay. So KJ is written the same way you know we discussed earlier. Any questions? Sir, one more question. Yeah. Is the activation energy same as uh, ignition energy, sir? Oh uh, no, that's totally uh, different. Ignition energy is like a for the system, not for any individual reaction. Okay. Now, any system, okay, most of the time the reactions are going both in the forward and the backward direction. Okay. So, like going back here, so this reaction, O2 plus H giving OH plus O, in the system you also have OH and O species. It's not like this, just produced from this reaction. So since you have OH and O species, <coughs> this reaction can be going in the backward direction also. You have to consider both, you know, forward and backward. Okay. So that's very easy, you know, you can write either half of the reactions or you just write all the, 20, let's say you have 20 reactions, then actually it becomes like 40 reactions because you have forward and backward reactions going on. So then the, if you consider a reaction rate, if you consider a reaction which is going forward and backward, so first you consider the forward direction. Okay. So this is now the reaction rate constant for the forward reaction for the jth reaction. Okay. So forward, then here you have Ci nu Ij prime. For the backward reaction, this is you now Kjb. Okay, the reaction rate constant for the backward reaction. So for forward and backward, k value is different. K means the pre-exponential is different, and the activation energy is different. Okay. So those are different. Oops, press the wrong button. And then here the most important is here. Okay. The concentration of species I raised to the power now, new Ij double prime, because the reaction is going from product to reactant, or in the opposite direction. So this is not double prime. Okay, and then of course you can write. So this is the net reaction rate for the jth reaction. Forward minus the backward reaction. Okay, and then this is the reaction for the individual species. You know you are summing over all the reactions. Okay. So you are asking about the mechanism. So this is like a commonly used mechanism for hydrogen oxidation. Okay. There are few other available. I forgot <coughs> the name of this. There is a name which goes with this. I think it's called. Conair maybe, if somebody has used it, it's called Conair mechanism. And of course, you know, uh, there's constantly some reaction rate constants are being changed. So this is not like the end for even for hydrogen. So what is Sorry? Is oh yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, M is the, you know, all the species other than the other, you know, the, like for example, uh, number five, right? So M is the, all the species other than hydrogen. So hydrogen molecules can collide with any other molecule to produce that reaction, okay? M directly does not change. The value of M does not change. It appears same on the both sides. Okay, so it's the concentration of the mixture, you can say, minus hydrogen. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether it has any special meaning. You can write without the bracket. Okay. So basically, it is HO2, and then the third body is involved, which is M, producing HO2 plus M. Okay. So this is an example. Okay, you write the, all the reactions. Okay. And all of these reactions could be going forward and backward. Okay. And then this is how you write. Okay. So this is the WJ is the reaction rate for any of these reactions. So J, you know, goes one up to twenty one. Okay. Forward and backward. And then this is the rate of change of concentration of any species I. So it is summed over all the reactions. So NR here is 21. And if you count the number of species, total is 7. Okay. So I'll show some results later on. And they may occur simultaneously or serially? No, no, simultaneously basically. Yeah. yeah. But the only thing is when you start with hydrogen and oxygen, so there has to be some initiation reaction. Okay, so there is some initiation reaction. Okay. So basically you have hydrogen and oxygen in your system and they are colliding, right? So to reaction to proceed, you need some radical species like H, O. So all these radical species are very reactive because of the unbalanced, you know, okay, electron on their outer orbit. So they are very reactive. And their concentrations are very low because they are being produced and they are also being consumed at the same time. So you are initially you need the production of some like hydrogen radical or some other radical. Once you have that, then the reaction, all the reactions appear. They are not like sequentially. Only some initiation reactions are you know needed you know, to start the process. Okay, now let's see. We are supposed to go until 12, right? 12.30. 12 12.30, okay. All right. So, <coughs> so I think many of you might have seen this. This is a very basic, you know, collision rate theory. There are more advanced theories, okay. So this is based on very simple kinetic theory ideas, okay. So you can read through this. So the basic idea is that a gas okay, has two species. And so these species, molecules, they are colliding. Okay. So this is for a bimolecular reaction. That means there are two species. Okay. So they are as they are, so they are randomly moving. So I just say ideal gas model. So their motion is not influenced by the other molecules. Only there are collisions. Okay. So in this model, you have to count, okay, what is the frequency of collision? In one second, how many collisions occur? Okay. So the number of collisions per unit time. Okay. And then what is the probability of collision giving you reaction? So the number of collisions times the probability of a reaction from that collision. So that's the basic idea. Okay. So we write the equation for the number of collisions, and then we multiply this by the probability of collision giving you reaction. Okay. As I said, there are more advanced theories which are used. So this is just to give you some basic ideas. Okay. So there is a cartoon of the model on the next slide. So I had asked a graduate student to make this picture initially, so it took him a lot of time to make this for the slide. <laughs> okay. So it's showing you know two different molecules by the colors and the size. So now we are looking at the molecule at the molecular level. 
Okay. So these molecules are colliding and this shows the zoomed view. So what we consider is we focus on one molecule. Okay. So one molecule, so I can I think draw it here. Sorry, question? So we focus on one molecule. The molecular diameter are using sigma A. Okay. <coughs> and for the development of this model, we assume that okay, it's going in straight line. Okay. So they are moving randomly, but for a very short time it could be assumed that it is going in a straight line. Then it is the is going in this direction, right? Volume is populated by the other molecules, molecules B. Okay, so here are the other molecules. So now we to count the number of collisions. If molecule B is here, it's not going to collide, right? If it is here, it's going to collide. Okay, so that means there is a collision diameter, sigma A. This is sigma b, and then on this side sigma b. Okay, so if any molecule is in this collision volume, okay, the collision will occur. Okay, so this then radius for this volume is sigma a plus sigma b divided. So these are the diameters. Okay. So as it goes, it is going at a velocity, what is the symbol I'm using, u, a, b. So these are all average properties. These are not instantaneous values, okay? So this is the velocity of molecule A with respect to B, okay? Average velocity. So then this volume traversed is pi, so this is a, <coughs> so this is sigma a, b. So it will be pi sigma a b square, okay? That's the cross-sectional area, okay? So in one second, the distance covered will be times u a b, correct? Okay. So this is the volume, okay? Traversed by this molecule. Considering, sorry? Yeah. Even for a bigger molecule, we assume only a spherical shape. Like yeah, molecule, this is one of the, you can say drawback, all the molecules we assume this spherical shape, yeah, okay, correct. <coughs> so this is the volume traversed by molecule A in one second, okay. So then we multiply by the number of molecules per unit volume, which is the uh, symbol is, let's say N, B, per unit volume, so this will be the concentration of molecules, okay, not the moles. So molecule concentration which is Cb. Okay. So these are the number of collisions experienced by one molecule A, okay. So another number, concentration of molecule A is also needs to be considered, so we multiply by Ca. So this gives an approximate equation for the number of collisions per unit time, okay? So pi sigma a b square, let me see if I left out anything. Yeah, okay. Oh, C a is, this is mole, sorry. N a and b. So these are the number of molecules per unit volume, okay? So now we bring the concentration. Why you want the concentration? Because in the reaction rate term, we are using concentration. So coming back here, so see here, you are using concentrations. So one and two are the same thing as A and B, okay? 
So we change the number of molecules to the concentration. Going back here. OK. So now we change this number of molecules per unit volume to number of moles per unit volume. So we're multiplying by that. So number of moles times Avogadro number is the number of molecules. OK. So here, for example, Ca, what is Ca? Number of moles per unit volume. OK. So this is the number of, OK. So times Avogadro number is the number of molecules per unit volume. So we change it to concentration, then you get this Avogadro number square. Oops. Avogadro number square. So this is the frequency of collision. Okay. So frequency of collision, which is Z, that's the frequency of collision. And then this term represents the probability of collision giving you reaction. Okay. So that's the same activation energy divided by the temperature. Okay. So this again comes from the stat statistical theory that what is the probability of collision with energy more than E. Okay. So that's how it comes there. So the collision frequency times the pro probability of collision Okay, and then you divide by the Avogadro number because these were the number of collisions of molecules. Okay, you divide by the Avogadro number gives you the rate of change of concentration. Okay, because now it becomes the reaction rate in terms of dCi dt, the rate of change of concentration. So we divide by the Avogadro. So this is the expression we get. Okay. And then we multiply by another factor. Okay. So this factor is also less than one. Okay. What is this factor? It accounts, so this is called the steric factor. This P is the steric factor. It accounts for the geometry of collisions. Okay. So it depends on you know, how these molecules are colliding. So here I'm using this example, H plus O2. So it should give you H2O, right? So H2O is like this, right? Okay. O molecule, you know, flanked by two hydrogen, uh, O atom flanked by two hydrogen atom. So the reacting molecules are H plus OH. Okay. So H and O and H, this is the <coughs> orientation. This is more likely to happen compared to Collision happens like this. So this collision less likely to give you H2O. <coughs> okay. So it accounts for the okay, geometry of collision. Okay. Geometry of collisions. So colliding molecules require certain orientation for reaction uh, to happen. So there are lots of other examples like this. So main thing is this P factor is introduced for this to take, you know, to account for that. Now, now we can use these expressions for, okay, for this velocity, which is the average kinetic velocity of the molecule. Okay. So this comes from the kinetic theory. So UAB square is eight. This is the Boltzmann constant. Temperature and it contains this molecular mass, mu a b. And this is the expression for the molecular mass. Okay. So this we are taking from the kinetic theory, you know, these equations. So we substitute these equations for u a b. So we end up with this equation for the reaction rate. So, so this is how we get <coughs> an equation based on the simple okay, bimolecular collision or bimolecular uh, model. 
okay, or bimolecular reaction model. So it contains this various molecular properties. So here you have sigma A, then you have the mass, Boltzmann constant, okay, then the concentration. So it has the basic elements which we saw in the phenomenological law of mass action, right? So it had the reaction rate constant, then the concentration of two species, right, Ca and Cb. So it has the activation energy, then the concentrations, and the rest of it is absorbed in the pre-exponential factor. Okay. So we can compare this now with the model we had for the you know two molecule reactions. So that's on the next slide. So this expression when compared given by the law of mass action. So if you compare this, okay, we can write an expression for K. Because K times C A times C B gives the reaction rate, right? Okay, so now we have two expressions for the reaction rates. So equating those, we can get equation for K. Okay. And using this, if you calculate, okay, this reaction rate constant and compare with the, okay, actual values, you'll see there's a lot of difference. Okay, so this only gives you qualitative behavior; it doesn't give you the exact equation, equation exact numbers. Okay. It also gives you that uh, alpha factor, which we are discussing. So based on this theory, you get alpha equal to 0.5, but actually, actual value of alpha can vary anywhere from zero and one. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So we covered now, just to summarize, the reaction rate for one reaction, and then when you have multiple reactions in a mechanism, and then for each elementary reaction, using this simple collision rate theory, we can get an expression for K. Okay, another topic which is normally covered in this chemical kinetics is the equilibrium constants. Okay. So we already covered this equilibrium constant in the previous material when we consider the equilibrium composition. So we call that Kp. Okay. So Kp is the equilibrium constant based on the partial pressures. So let me, yeah, Kp. So Kp is defined as product, okay, from I to Ns. Ns is the number of species. Pi over P0. So this is the same definition we had used in while discussing the equilibrium composition. Okay. Because now when it is double prime, that's the product, okay, and this is the reactant. So product will be positive, reactant will be negative, so it will go in the denominator automatically. Okay. <coughs> so for example, if you use that example, let's say Simple example, O2 giving you 2O. So what will be this value? PO2, the partial pressure of O2, divided by the reference pressure, okay? Raised to the power, what will be the raised to the power? Okay, what is this value for O2? So I is now O2, okay? No, O2. Okay, 
so this is 0 this is 1 okay so this will be power minus 1 okay and then for o it will be partial pressure of o divided by p0 okay this value will be 2 this will be 0 so this will be square okay so whatever reaction you are considering okay using this terminology you know things take care by themselves okay. so this is based on the partial pressure then there are <coughs> some other you know equilibrium constant based on concentration okay and also based on mole fraction okay they are all related because partial pressure PCO, PO, uh, let me write PI, partial pressure, okay, uh, divided by the total pressure, this is mole fraction, okay. So if you, you can replace this PI here by XI, okay, and that gives you the equation I written there, okay. So. take the pointer so that gives us this equation okay so kb can be written in terms of kx what is kx okay the same expression now in terms of the mole fraction okay so let's write kx So Kx is Xie. Okay. Sometimes we use E to indicate that okay this is at equilibrium. Okay. But we use that anyway whether it's not in equilibrium or not. Okay. So we don't need to tag this you know <coughs> E along. So this is raised to the power again nu i double prime minus nu i, and then you have the product sign. So for this system, this will be x o square minus x o two. Okay, similar to this. Now x o we can replace by partial pressure. Okay, so x o will be p o divided by p. Okay. Now we have to bring this P0 there. Okay. <coughs> so this is square. So P subscript square, P subscript square, and then XO2 is PO2, P, and then P0 over P0. Okay, so now we can write this in terms of Kp. Okay, so what else is left here? So what else is left here is, so this P0, P02 is taken care, then PO2 divided by P0 is taken care, okay. So what is left there is P zero over P. Okay. The general expression is shown here. Equation between Kp and Kx. Okay. So the difference is only the pressure. Okay, because we are using this equation. Okay. Kp contains, you know. The ref so the P to the subscript, a superscript, that's the reference pressure. Okay. P is the actual pressure of the system. Okay. So that's why you get this P over P0 raised to the power sum of this nu i du double prime minus nu i prime. So this is one equation, that's for Kx. Similarly, you can get for Kc. Okay. So Kc is the
based on concentration. Concentration. concentration okay then you'll get p0 which is the reference pressure over rut okay because pi is concentration times rut okay so using this expression here in pi we can get an equation for kc okay. <coughs> where kc is defined this is not the definition where is kc i think it's on the previous slide yeah that's the definition for kc okay so basically you know you have three equilibrium co constants based on partial pressure that's the expression then based on concentration they're all very similar so concentration raised to the power nu i double prime minus nu i prime okay and the third one based on the mole fraction where is that one this one okay. and they are all related because mole fraction and concentration are related to partial pressure Now, question is, what is how is this is relevant for okay, chemical reactions? <coughs> <coughs> now, if you consider any reaction, for example, this this is one of the very common reactions, O2 plus H giving U H plus O. So, this reaction is going both in the forward and the backward direction. Okay, and then you can write the net rate for this reaction, forward rate. Okay, minus the backward rate. Okay. <coughs> now, many times, okay, we consider the reaction to be in equilibrium. That means the forward rate and the backward rate, okay, they are equal. So, if the reaction is in equilibrium, we can define this equilibrium constant based on the concentration because here we contain we have concentrations. Okay. So basically, then it becomes Kf over Kb if this reaction is in equilibrium. Okay. <coughs> so what does that mean? Then we don't need to determine both Kf and Kb. We can write Kb in terms of Kf and Kc. Okay. So when you in this reaction rate equation, we can replace this Kb by Kc. So Kb is, so the now we need to only determine Kf for this reaction, not both Kf and Kb. And the idea is that the backward reaction is much lower than the forward rate. So this is a separate thing, okay. The idea is that it's easier to determine Kc compared to Kb, okay. So that's why you use this. <coughs> Any questions? I think we need some tea break right now. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so that's how we use this equilibrium. So we consider also in some cases the backward reaction rate is much lower, especially in the beginning, because when you have this reaction, it requires H radical, right? So initially, the concentration of OH and O is very small. Okay. So if the concentration is slow, then what is the backward reaction rate? It will be very small. So the backward reaction will be very slow, okay? <coughs> so we can neglect that, okay? So these are the, some of the things we need to be aware of when we write these reaction rates. Okay. So now when you have a big mechanism, okay, so these are all important things to consider, okay? So what is written on the first bullet? So equation nine provides the source and sink terms in the conservation equation for energy and species. Let me see if I have the equation number nine here. I think I missed one slide. But anyway, we know what is equation nine, and I'll tell you again. So equation nine, that is basically 
DCI DT so this is given on the other slide DCI DT this equation okay. so DCI DT so this equation okay so then you have like 21 reactions so you can write all the reactions 21 reactions and then you have nine species or oh sorry seven species so you have seven equations like this. Okay. So now when you write the governing equations, okay, so you have seven species, right? So there will be seven conservation equations for the seven species. Okay. So in each species you will have a source term which will look like this. Okay. So the right hand side will be the source term. Okay. The concentration of the species will be determined of course not just by reactions also by convection, by diffusion, by other processes. So you write the equation for the conservation of each species. So there will be seven equations. So in each equation, there will be a source term, which will be what is the right hand side. Okay. So that's what it is talking about. Okay. So it provides the source term for the conservation equations for species. It will also appear in the energy equation, which we'll see later. Okay. So if the reaction mechanism and the reaction rate constants are known, so it provides a closed system for DNS. Okay, then you can solve those equations. Okay. Exactly. Now, development of a comprehensive validated mechanism along with the reaction rate is one of the major challenges in stability. Okay. So even if a mechanism is available, DNS is challenging because of the size of the mechanism. So that's one factor, because it takes lots of computational power to do the DNS. Okay, because the mechanism may be very large. Okay, you might have like there are mechanisms, you know, which are like 4,000 reactions. So how do you do DNS for any realistic system? Other challenges. Okay, for DNS also, there is a wide range of scale, length scales and time scales. Okay, if you are doing a laminar flow, even then there are many large length scales and time scales. Okay, when it is turbulent flow, it becomes nearly impossible. So the main thing is that you cannot use these full mechanisms. You have to find a way to reduce the mechanisms. So then the steady state approximation Partial equilibrium, these are some of the techniques they use to reduce the number of species and the number of reactions. So they basically reduce the number of equations then to be solved. Okay. Because if you are say 200 species, then you have 200 equations, right? And these are differential equations. So some of them, if you can be replaced by algebraic equation, then the computational requirement will also be reduced. Okay, so that's the main idea of using the steady state approximation. So steady state approximation deals with, okay, with the fact that some species are in steady state. Their concentration do not change. <coughs> and that pertains to mostly atomic species like hydrogen. Okay. So some of the species can be assumed to be in steady state. Their concentration do not change though they, the, they, are, they are participating in the reaction. Okay, they are participating in different reactions. But what happens is the rate of consumption almost balances the rate of production. Okay. So for those species, you don't need to consider the reaction rates okay, because they are in, in almost steady state. Okay. So the steady state approximation deals with a particular species. Okay. Other thing is Partial equilibrium. Partial equilibrium deals with the actual reaction. Okay. So there we say that the forward reaction rate is balanced by the backward reaction rate for a reaction, not for the species. Okay. So you have to understand the difference between the steady state approximation for a species 
Okay. We can take a simple example, you know, for going from back to this mechanism. Okay. So for example, now H2O we cannot use U assume to be in a steady state. Okay. Only H or O can be in a steady state. Okay. So how do you write the reaction rate for H2O using this mechanism? Okay, which will appear in the, as a source term when you write the full governing equation for H2O. Okay. So let's write that as an example from here. Yeah. No, HO2 is there. No, HO2. Yeah. Oh, HO2 is. No, 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 HO2 is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, in other species also, there's nine is HO2. Oh, wait a minute, three, four, five, six. No, no, there may be even more. There may be a mistake here. Okay. If the internet is working, we can look at this mechanism you know, from online. No, no, HO2 is a very important species. We'll discuss in the next set, you know, afternoon. So you are absolutely right. No, it's no, we are not avoiding. It's just <laughs> omitted by mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for noticing that. So if you write, now let's focus on this equation. Okay, and consider I to be H2O. So the reaction rate for H2O, okay, so you have new I, so I is for H2O, double prime, J minus new H2O, J single prime, times omega J, correct? Okay. So now, looking at those 21 reactions, it's very interesting. I've given this lecture several times in the you know, classes. Never noticed. <laughs> H2O is missing. I have this again, but so I'll double check. OK, so now J is 1 through 21. Okay. First reaction. This is zero, this is zero. So everything taken care of by itself, okay? Second reaction, no H2O. Third reaction, there is H2O, okay? <coughs> so for the third reaction, we write this. This is one, this is zero. So this will be omega three, okay? So let's write just omega right now, okay? Otherwise, it will look very complicated. Then fourth reaction, nothing, five, six, seven, eight. okay, eight, okay. Now, I'm only writing now, assuming forward for simplicity. Fourth reaction we have, on the reaction side. Oh yeah, okay. And I'm only writing, you know, the forward, okay. There is also backward, because if you look at this expression, it is forward and backward for WJ, okay. And then so, this will be minus the omega 4 for the fourth reaction. And then number 8. So minus omega 8. <coughs> okay. And 13. So plus omega 13. No 15, 16s. Yeah, 17 plus omega 17. Okay. And then 18, no. Yeah, 20 and 21. So plus 20. And then plus 21. And for each of this, okay. The right hand side, okay. So, like omega 3, okay, you can consider forward and backward, 
you can write the expression. Okay. So this is the nomenclature used also in the software when they write software. So this is how you write these reaction rates. So these are generalized nomenclature. Now as far as the steady state approximation, so I'll use an example, you know, in the afternoon. Okay. Hopefully I can find that example and we'll use that. So again, steady state approximation, you know, deals with the species. Okay. So as a crude example, <coughs> if you assume steady state approximation for this species. Okay, which is not real. So then we say this is equal to zero. Okay. So that reduces you know, the number of calculations. Okay. Because if you use that steady state approximation for any given species. As I said, the normality is applied to some radical species. Okay. I think this I already mentioned the partial equilibrium assumption. Whereas the partial equilibrium assumption is applied to a reaction, like Wj, okay? Whereas steady state is to Wi, okay? Experimentally, how do they measure the concentration of the various species? Listed itself, or even for a two O2 reaction, we have identified about 27 species. Yeah, the concentrations, you know, like shock tube, they use uh, this mass spectrometers. Okay, uh, I can show you some results. Okay, we don't use two shock tubes, you know. People, you know, they can tell you easily, you know. They, they can measure very, very small amounts of species these days. Okay, uh, we have measured like, you know, in flames, we have measured for soot, you know, like uh, aromatic compounds like benzene or naphthalene, okay. Those are like 10 to the power of minus eight, minus seven. So per, you know, below PPM they can measure, okay. A lot of work going on in, you know, using shock tubes. Because still there are a lot of uncertainties. So some people, they focus on like one reaction and then try to determine the reaction rate constant by measuring the concentration as function of time. The idea is to get you know the E value and the pre-exponential. Okay. And that is by plotting the log of that reaction rate constant. Okay, by measuring the reaction rate and the concentration. Okay. So I think we'll end it, you know, when this set of slides ends. I think there are only one or two left. So if you want to take a water break, we can take like 30 second break. <laughs> and if you have any some questions. For example, you know, as far as like my experience, I'm not a chemistry person, okay. When I was in college, you know, like I always, I mean, didn't like chemistry. It was difficult for me. Now I had to use a lot of reactions. <laughs> okay. <coughs> but so what I, you know, like last 20 years, okay, my focus has been to use the reaction rates and find some, you know, some difficulties and then, you know, consult with people. How do you fix those, you know, problems with the reaction rates? Because we do, you know, simulation of flames or we do engine simulation and try to use, you know, more detail and then do a lot of analysis, okay? Or determine the ignition delay, okay? So later on in the slides, we have, you know, all this, you know, stuff. So you can compute the ignition delay by using software these days, okay? And then not only ignition delay, you can also see what species are important, what reactions are important, okay? 
And then if you change the reaction rate constant for those reactions, how the ignition delay will change. So do the sensitivity analysis. So from there, you can improve some mechanisms. So to that extent, we have done work. Okay. Sir, Third body, yeah. No, third body is whatever else is there in the in your system. No, it does not change. Uh, you know, this this is the idea. The concentration of M doesn't change due to reaction because M appears on both sides. Okay. So here now. Okay. No, the, by the way, the state of the art is that a lot of mechanisms are available. Okay. Now, slowly, the tools are also becoming available where you can take a very detailed mechanism and also can, you can get a reduced mechanism using those software tools. Okay. And then use the reduced mechanism. Because in those tools, they do the, some kind of validation for the reduced mechanism. That's how they get the reduced mechanism. Yeah, so here I just want to distinguish what is the elementary reaction and what is a global reaction. Okay. So global reaction is an approximation. Okay. <coughs> Whereas this is based on more fundamentals. That actually the molecules, O2 molecules and H atoms, the collide and give you OH and O at the molecular level. So this process occurs at the molecular level. Whereas this is just a global global uh, observation. Okay. So for this reaction, for the global reaction also you can write a similar reaction rate. Okay. But now these values, you know, A and B and A and E, they are all based on the experimental data for H2O2 <coughs> and H2O. Okay. So this has nothing to do with the molecular processes. Okay. Over the years, you know, in 60s, 70s, even you know, 80s, people are using one reaction. The people still use one reaction when they do, for example, you know, pre-mixed, you know, turbulent flames. They use one reaction. Okay. <coughs> for pre-mixed flames. So then they use you know, equation like this. And then they fit the experimental data using right values of A and B. Okay, so that's a global reaction. Okay. At the elementary reaction level, the molecular level, we can define, you know, unimolecular reactions, that where there's only one molecule, okay, participates on the reactant side, okay. The reverse reaction is not unimolecular. The reverse reaction will be bimolecular, hydrogen and hydrogen. Okay. Then bimolecular are the most common. Okay. And then, th th you know, three body reactions. Okay. <laughs> also, when you consider this unimolecular, bimolecular, and termolecular, the pressure effects become very important. Okay. <clears throat> because if the pressure is very low, okay, what it means that the concentration of the reactant species is very low. Okay. So extreme case, you know, concentration becomes very low. Okay. Then the probability of a bimolecular reaction becomes low compared to a unimolecular reaction. Okay. Because just H2 decomposing becomes more probable than H plus H com combining because of the low concentration. Okay. On the other hand, the pressure is very high the three body reactions become more important. It's just like in a, you know, if the room is not very crowded, uh, crowded and let's say, you know, you are bl blindfolded, you know. So when you collide, if there are not many people, the probability of collision is very low. But if the room is totally crowded, then you'll be colliding, you know, three people will be colliding at the same time, compared to two. So probability of bimolecular reactions Okay, or I should say, third molecule three body reactions become more as the pressure goes up. So third body reactions become important at high pressures. Okay, at very low pressure, okay, 
the univalent reactions are more important compared to bimolecular.